Uh, good evening. I'm Chuck Davis, and I'm pleased uh, to be on the board of directors for the Photographic Society of Northwest Arkansas and uh, be the facilitator for the Distinguished Photographer Series. Uh, we're here just a day after the Memorial Day holiday, and I'm glad so many of you have taken the time, uh, knowing that you're very busy, to join us tonight. Uh, Doug Hansen is out of Chicago land area, and he's well known in the Midwest, especially for the, the volume and range of antique photographic methods that he chooses to work in. Uh, I've known Doug for just a little while, but it always is extraordinary to me how much experimentation that he does in his photography, which is, of course, a hallmark from the very beginning of time in uh, photographic methods. Uh, Doug uh, worked at uh, Motorola, so this is his second career, perhaps. And uh, he's had several solo shows, including one solo show I was reading just this evening in Malaysia. So welcome, Doug Hansen. And this is all about uh, making pictures in an analog world. Um, thank you to Chuck for inviting me and also to the Photographic Society of Northwest Arkansas. And I am Doug Hansen. And I'm a photographer out of the uh, near Chicago area, we'll say. I'm out in the suburbs. And today, um, I'm going to be talking about making pictures. Let me first tell you what uh, today's discussion is not going to be. It's not going to be this classic and somewhat tedious discussion of making versus taking pictures. I know that there's a lot of uh, people in the photographic community who labor over that semantics and, and what that means. Um, that's not what today is going to be about. What today is going to be about is my journey in making pictures. And a lot of it's going to be analog, as, as uh, Chuck said. So uh, with that, let's jump to the first uh, slide. So I'm going to talk about my path not to bore you with my history, because that's not very interesting, but it does inform what I'm going to discuss in the later charts and slides. And it has to do with my path, which involves the confluence, if you will, between art and science. And uh, that's, that's kind of going to become very evident as we go through the discussion today, uh, how those two things intertwine relate to each other, integrate, overlap, cycle, whatever you want to say. Um, but at the heart of this, making pictures uh, seem to uh, want for a definition here, at least a little bit. And if, if I were to give it one, I would say that making pictures for me is, is basically action with intent. So if you take an action, whether it's uh, setting up a scene or simply moving around an object to frame it better, um, you're taking an action that, which, which has the intention of making a better photograph. And for me, that's the de definition of making photographs or making pictures. Uh, in this discussion, I'm going to take it a little bit further and we're going to take making pictures to a little bit more of a uh, hands-on and a, a mechanical or, or analog perspective. So. With that, let's flip to the next one, which is going to fill in a little bit of this. So when I say that my journey was a confluence of art and science, what I'm talking about is that uh, I was born into a um, parents who were both commercial artists. And uh, they worked out of my home. And I grew up with constantly with paint on all my clothes. Um, and I worked in their commercial art business from about the age of nine or so up through college. And I would do paste up and, and back in those days there was no computers so we painted animation cells by hand for animated uh, commercials and things like that. Uh, it was a great lot of fun. Um, I didn't see it as very hard work but of course we worked a lot. And uh, so the commercial art was around me all the time and to be honest with you I kind of took it for granted. And when it came time to go to college, I decided to go into electrical engineering because I was also very fond of science, uh, including physics and chemistry. 
but I chose electrical engineering. And along about midlife, the art bug came back and bit me again, and I started painting. Don't ask me why. That's just what I chose to do. And I was doing oil painting. And I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, my, my particular technique was realism. And so I found myself painting portraits and uh, things of that nature. And they actually began to sell. And I was getting commissions uh, for my painting. You're not going to see any of my paintings today. So that's not what this uh, presentation is about. But the painting led me to photography. And it did that in this way. Uh, when my painting started to leave me, I realized that I had no evidence, no proof, no archival record of what I had done. And so probably about 15 years or so ago, I bought myself a nice digital camera, at least what I thought was a nice one, and figured that would be sufficient for making archival photos of my paintings. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> my my photos of my paintings were horrible. There was glare, there was uh, distortion, there was color aberrations. Uh, everything you can think of was wrong with these photos. And I was very dissatisfied. And so being kind of a self-learner and uh, a researcher, I dug into photography a little bit to try and understand what I had done wrong. and. I did. I finally figured out what I had done wrong, and I perfected the ability to take good archival photos of my paintings. As a matter of fact, as a sideline today, I still take archival photos of other artists' paintings. That's one of my little sidelines that I do. Um, and they keep coming back, so I think I, I figured it out. But in any case, as I learned about photography, I really began to enjoy and appreciate photography as an art form unto itself. And so that's really the, the, how the journey started here. And uh, But again, this, this cycle through art and science is something that continues to happen for me. Um, I've recently got enamored with 3D printing and software control for all kinds of things. I'm a big uh, sustainable energy enthusiast, so solar energy is a big thing for me. Um, but it also loops back and it informs uh, some of the work I'm doing now in animatronics and lighting art, things like that. So art and science are a big loop for me, and you're going to see that in the presentation going forward. But let's go back to that moment where I bought a digital camera. So Chuck, if you can move to that slide. So when I got this digital camera, sure, I took pictures of my artwork, and eventually I became satisfied with it. But I realized what a tool I had in my hands. And uh, I was quite thrilled at, with the possibilities of a digital camera. Uh, and I explored a lot of the things that you could do with a digital camera. Of course, I learned all the basics, right? I learned all the PASM modes and everything about apertures and uh, shutter speeds and color temperature, optics, you name it. I dug really deep on this, um, but I, I loved applying this to things that were possible that I saw out there. And keep in mind, probably nothing I've ever done is really original. I've never done anything probably groundbreaking, but I've explored a lot of things. And so I, I use digital and, and little microcontrollers to freeze action for water drops balloon pops, things like this. And, and that was a lot of fun for a while. I don't know if it was art, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, but I also did uh, a lot of in-camera double exposure with my fancy camera, um, kind of combining this, this an, an artistic splash of, of ink with, with the uh, uh, double exposure. So things like that really fascinated me. But at the same time, I also chose to start doing the classics. So exploring the classic things that you do in photography, like still lifes, like portraiture. Okay. So my message here is for me, the technology certainly inspires creativity. And that creativity for me 
manifests a vision of what I want to do. And that vision often requires planning, sometimes extensive planning. And that planning leads to a very, very direct intent of making a picture. It's certainly not some offhanded snapshot or something like this. It's, it's very intentional. And above all, uh, lots of learning, learning, learning. So I got into this thing you know, digitally to begin with. And, and again, this was only about 15 years ago, so I'm not a lifelong film photographer. Uh, but certainly since then, I've made enough, enough images to qualify as a lifelong photographer since then. So digital was fine, um, but I, the engineer in me began to wonder, you know, well, wait a minute, where did this come from? And I remembered that I had taken some film photography back in the 80s. Um, it was just snapshots of my growing family. And I thought, wow, that's, uh, that's something that people are still doing. And, and it was a little surprising to me, being that we were in the digital age, but there were still people doing uh, film photography. And I said to myself, you know, there's something about the film photography that's just a little unique. And we can debate that. That's a whole separate lecture on, you know, what's unique about film photography versus digital photography. But there was something there, and I wanted to explore that. And so that led me to film. So, Chuck, if you could advance to the next one. Yeah, I'd be happy to advance. Uh, Doug, before we go, though, the upper image, is that uh, a laser trigger? The the water blob that's coming up, did you, is that a laser trigger, how you achieved that? Uh, actually, no. So again, I'm kind of into microcomputer control of things. So what what this was is there there is a, a solenoid up above that would release a single drop of water or water with glycerin added and, or milk. I did a lot of different liquids. Um, but the uh, the microcontroller would release this drop, and then you could program in um, how long, what kind of delay you needed. And of course, it's gravity, right? So uh, we all know the the rate of gravity. Um, how long you needed for that drop to splash? And what this is is that this is actually the collision of a second drop with the first drop to create that kind of top splash area. Um, but this was all something I programmed into a microcontroller so that I didn't have to take a thousand pictures to get the photo. <laughs> so how did you get the, how did you trigger the, the camera then? If, if that's how you release the drop, how did you trigger the camera to capture the image? So, so the microcontroller uh, had a output to trigger the camera. So it was just the uh, remote uh, trigger on the camera. So this was digital. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a shutter release cable. It was, uh, you know, electronic. So there's an output to trigger the camera, and there's also an output to trigger the strobes. So this was, um, I, I had a couple uh, speed lights on either side um, gelled with um, blue and I think maybe some red gels and uh, just to play around with different types of uh, coloration on the thing. Well, thank you for the comments. I'm, I'm ready to move on if you are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. So you can move on. Um, but certainly, uh, my technologist flair for things I, I'm already obviously has come through here. Uh, and, you know, to a degree, there's more of that to come. But I was talking about film. And um, so I, I uh, actually was loaned a film camera, 35 millimeter film camera from a friend, loaded it up, took some photos. And at the time, I didn't know that there was uh, still any labs around that developed film. And so I kind of assumed I had to develop myself, which I had never done before. And so I'm sure there's people on this call who have developed their own film, either back in time uh, when you were students or you were practicing, or maybe even still to this day. And I'm sure the shared experience is the first time you see a roll of film come out of the Patterson tank or whatever you used, and saw those images on there, those negative images, it, it's pure magic, pure magic. And I was just awestruck and totally hooked. So uh, as I looked into what you could do with film, I realized that this was yet another set of possibilities. 
um, especially processing it yourself. You can push it, you can pull it, you can agit over agitate it, under agitate it. Um, you can even add weird stuff to the to the uh, tank to uh, uh, make it do different things. Uh, a friend of mine once came over and uh, said, I, I, I saw people develop color film in weird ways to create weird colors. And I said, oh, yeah, we can do that. So we used everything from pickle juice to uh, boiling it. Um, so the, the possibilities are endless. I'm, I'm not a big fan of the strange effects, and you'll, you'll see that throughout the presentation. I like making clean images for the most part but I have experimented with some of the other things there. So the, the process of, of doing film, again, inspires creativity for me. And also, all the classic photographers shot film. And I won't name them all. You all learned about them in, in school or you heard about them elsewhere. Um, but all this classic photography was done in black and white and i really just fell in love with black and white imagery um and and i had visions about what i wanted to make in black and white film and that again that requires planning so there's some redundancy here in these bullet points uh because i'm trying to make a point so that planning leads to intention once again whether you're trying to photograph still lights or motion uh, you know kind of a um, an image with some feeling to it, uh, whether it's portraits or, or um, some abstract um, textures as shown on here, um, or something as simple as an isolated feather uh, can be quite emotive if you think about it and you plan ahead and you, and you try and realize your vision on that. So at the end of the day, process and technology does provide a significant motivation for me. But at the end of the day, it's about the image. If I do all that and I don't get a, a worthy picture, well, I don't really consider it successful. So um, it's, it's the full process. It's the full path for me in getting to the image. And once again, uh, this is about learning, learning, learning. And uh, it wasn't enough to just take the pictures. Um, I eventually built myself a full dark room so uh, these days, almost all of my personal work is darkroom printed. So silver gelatin prints or any number of different processes, which you're going to hear about here. Um, I've even built a, a local community darkroom uh, in uh, cooperation with a local gallery. And so I, I teach there and bring other people into the community darkroom as well as my own uh, personal darkroom. So, that's film, and film is great, and everybody's probably done that. But let's get a little bit, uh, let's get a little bit crazier here, Chuck. So if you can, uh, one more. So as I learned about film, um, I was still buying the film. I was still using a commercially made camera, be it a Canon camera or a Pentax or whatever, and uh, commercially made lenses. And I really got to thinking, I, I'm a very hands-on person. I like to build. I like to create. And I really got to thinking about, well, wait a minute. What's, what's the simplest kind of photography you can do? And this brought me around to pinhole. And I love pinhole. And pinhole is not for everyone. You're, I, I tend to find that you're either a fan or you're not of pinhole photography. And I don't know what the reasons are. Uh, but some of the people, some people really love it, and uh, I'm, I'm uh, online friends with a lot of folks who are just passionate about pinhole. And there's some people who just really have no interest in it. But it's the simplest kind of photography you can do. My one of my first pinholes that I made was what you call a room pinhole, and that's where you blacken out a whole room of your house, and you cut a quarter inch uh, hole in um, uh, some black paper covering a window, and you project the entire goings-on of the outside world onto the opposite wall of your room in you know full 12 foot by eight foot glory. And uh, that was just a fascinating thing to do. And I think uh, everybody should try that. But 
more frequently, I was simply making pinhole cameras. And pinhole camera is just a soda can, a wooden box, anything you can make light type. And so what I loved about pinhole is that it was not about the gear. Um, I really, I turn off immediately when people start saying, oh, what kind of camera are you using for, you know, your work and everything? I'm not a gearhead. I own, I own a lot of cameras. Um, most of them probably cost me 50 to 100 bucks. Um, but I, I bought them for purpose. I, I, I want them because of their format or the lens selection that they come with and things like that. But I'm not about the gear. And so pinhole was really a way to express myself in that way, not using gear. So the simplicity and the limitations actually inspire creativity. It's how am I going to get that shot when I don't even have a viewfinder to look through, right? Think about that. So pointing a pinhole camera is a very approximate kind of thing. So the image shown here was, uh, is a crop of an 8x10 uh, pinhole image taken on uh, photo paper. And uh, as you can see, it's very moody, and uh, it, it, it realized the intent that I was going for. That doesn't always happen, but it did in this particular case. And the, the exposure on the black and white one was probably, I don't know, 60 seconds or something. So the nice thing is you can take the tape off of the, the pinhole and you can run into the image and, and, and do a selfie, right? The, the other image here, which is quite a bit smaller, uh, is something I do uh, every year. I make uh, solar cameras. And again, it's the same thing. It's the same pinhole lens. It's the same can. But what you do instead is you tape them up to a tree or a building or whatever, and you leave them for months and months. So the, the picture shown below is a six-month exposure. The difference is you don't develop the solar images. They come out of the can, and the sun has burned that image in. That, that extremely long exposure has burned that image into the paper. And as a matter of fact, this is black and white paper. The interesting thing is that when you uh, you scan and invert it, the interesting thing is it actually manifests colors, which is very surprising for black and white paper. And some of the colors can be actually quite surprising. So there's no development involved. It's the simplest process you could do. Photo paper in the can, you leave it up for six months, you pull it out, and you scan it. The reason you scan it is that paper is still active. Uh, you can't really fix those images. And if you leave it under the light, it will, it will obviously degrade. So that is my fascination with pinhole photography. It's very hands-on. You build your own cameras. Uh, and again, I've taught um, kids to adults, five to 80 years old, five years old to 80 years old, um, pinhole photography and, and had a lot of fun doing that. So. Uh, really, really interested in hands-on kind of photography. And that led to the next one. Beep. Let's uh, advance if there's no questions. So the next journey I took in hands-on photography was in alternative printing. So every time I, I found something, it's just this rabbit hole that just keeps on and going and going. And I would find the next thing. And so alternative printing was the next thing I found. And this is where it's not about the image capture, it's about the printing part of it. And I got really fascinated with all the possibilities. And most of these processes, uh, their origin was from the uh, second half of the 1800s. So one of the first ones I glommed onto was gum bichromate printing. Why I chose that one first, I have no idea, because it's, it's one of the more finicky uh, alternative printing processes. But um, I did, and I had lots and lots of failures before I started getting some images. And what really appealed to me about this particular method is that the images I got were very painterly. So it kind of, again, cycles around, in my experiences, back to that artistry of painting and made me realize I could combine photography and that painterly style and come up with uh, images that were uh, 
a little bit different, very pleasing. I'm not the first one to do gum bichromate, and I'm certainly not the best. There are artists out there who have dedicated their careers to doing gum bichromate. Um, but I'm very happy with some of the results I got. On the left is a, a monochromatic um, gum bichromate, uh, where you mix a little pigment in with the, uh, uh, with the emulsion, and, and you get this. But you're hand coating papers. It's a very hands-on process. The right one is a um, multi-layer or, or a multi-color print um, so that you can make a color image. And so that one's a little bit more involved because you take a color image and then you have to separate it out into CMYK uh, negatives. Um, so there is some Photoshop involved in, in some of these things if you want to go that route. But you don't have to. You can just simply make an alternative print by taking a negative that you make out of any camera. And the only limitation is you have to make a negative that's the same size as the uh, printed image that you want to make, which I'm going to kind of come around to how that's relevant in a few slides here. Um, so, but you got to get a negative, you, or you can print a negative. You can make a digital negative if you so choose. Um, the one on the left was actually made from a wet plate, glass wet plate negative, uh, 11 by 14 inches, so a rather large one. And the right was a uh, digital uh, negative. So again, very hands-on which was very important to me. Uh, it had me returning to a very painterly possibilities in my art. Um, the other thing is, when you start down this path of alternative processes uh, in printing, all of a sudden, it takes a lot of time. You're making emulsions, you're coating paper, and you're waiting for the paper to dry. You're exposing papers under UV light and washing them. And in the case of um, multicolor gum bichromates, you're drying those and then repeating the process with the next layer and the next color. And so the, the image on the right, you know, and I'm not claiming that this is uh, award-winning art here, but the image on the right, I think, you know, took me about a week to make that thing, which in the gum bichromate world is, is not that long. <laughs> so these take time. And the, the way that... The reason that's relevant here is that taking time can foster intent. I'm sure that no one here wants to invest a lot of time into something that's not going to yield, uh, you know, a, a good result or, or a result that pleases them or a result that expresses their intent. And so the element of taking time and you often find this with people who simply shoot film. They'll say, film makes me slow down and makes me think about my pictures more, makes me think about what I'm doing. So again, the action with intent is very uh, key, as far as I'm concerned, in making images. So um, there, I think there's a second slide, beep, on uh, alternative process, just because I didn't want to just throw in gum bichromate. I probably explored... Uh, I don't know, half a dozen, maybe more alternative processes. And um, cyanotype is, is uh, uh, one that I absolutely love. And Van Dyke Brown, I love the tones in Van Dyke, Van Dyke Brown. Uh, people call that BDB. Cyanotype is great because it's super easy to get a good result, unlike gum bichromate, which is, takes a lot, of, uh, a lot of refinement of your process. Cyanotype, you can get a good result just like that. At least I found that to be the case. And so I've used cyanotype to uh, teach uh, kids about alternative printing processes. So I'll go to a farmer's market, and, and I will have pre-coated maybe you know, 30 sheets of uh, watercolor paper with cyanotype emulsion and dried them the night before. And so they're only about, you know, so big. And um, in the course of uh, the marketplace, uh, parents and everybody will bring their kids. They Maybe the parents want to try it. And we will have them lay objects on the paper. They can go pick some flowers. I have boxes of uh, all kinds of junk that they can lay on there. And they simply set them out in the sun so that they get UV exposure for anywhere from three to five minutes, depending on how bright the day is. 
and the little kids get to wash it off in a in a tray of water and see their image appear. It, it's really quite magical. Um, most of them don't want to stop. <laughs> they want to make two, three, four images, and we hang them on a clothesline to dry and we get to take them home. So it's quite wonderful. Uh, cyanotypes don't always have to be blue. You can tone them in tea and coffee or wine or any number of things to create other tones other than blue. But I really love cyanotype. You can also make cyanotypes on any surface, watercolor paper, ceramic tile, wood. Um, lots of surfaces uh, will accept a cyanotype emulsion. So alternative processes are a great way to get very hands-on in your image making. And the images that I printed range from textures on the far right. I had a whole exhibit of uh, textures. That's just one of the pieces from that exhibit to portraits and any anything you want to choose. And they lend themselves to any subject matter that you might uh, you might pick. So that was handmade printing, if you will. And the next thing I got curious about is I said, well, if I can do handmade emulsions for printing, can I make handmade emulsions for the actual capture of images? So if you beep, move to the next one here. So the, so the next thing I explored, and, and again, this is, I'm not unique in this, but um, around 2012, I saw some images online for something called wet plate collodion. And I got fascinated. And like many things of this type, I decided I was going to do it one way or another. And wet plate collodion is an extremely hands-on process for making the emulsions and following through with the capturing of images in a completely handmade process. And I'm sure that most people have seen this. Maybe some of you have, have done it. And maybe some of you are making much better images than I am. And, and by the way, I wanted to comment this presentation, the images shown here, were are not a best of Doug. That's not what this presentation was about. I, I simply pulled out images that I thought kind of illustrated the, the range of things that you can do with that particular technique that I was talking about. So um, in any case, I, I learned the wet plate process and was really enamored with that. And a lot of people are very struck with the wet plate process, so much so that there's people out there and quite a few making filters for Instagram and everything else that turn your phone pictures into wet plate images. And of course, uh, true wet plate artists are always very, very critical of those things um, because they're not real. Uh, and and I I'm kind of don't jump into that fray. I'm, I'm not so uh, uh, concerned about defending our uh, wet plate integrity, but um, they are different. And one of the reasons is wet plate is uh, one of the earliest processes that existed. Um, the, the one that's credited as being the first, of course, is the daguerreotype. There was actually, you know, Talbot was playing with, you know, paper positive, paper negatives even before that, but he doesn't get much credit for things. But the daguerreotype is generally credited as the first processes, and that was 1939. Um, and wet plate came around not much later, uh, 1951. And so it's one of the very earliest processes. I have not done daguerreotype. Um, the classic daguerreotype involves the fuming of the plates with uh, um, uh, gaseous mercury, fumed mercury. And I choose not to do that. <laughs> um, I don't want to be subject to the Mad Hatter syndrome. So, uh, there is there are safer ways to do daguerreotypes today, and I'm not an expert on that. I don't claim to be, but I I said you know what wet plate's close enough. That's close enough to the origins of photography for me, and it also has its dangers. Okay, it's not the safest of processes, but it's manageable in my mind, and so um, I went down that wet plate path. Now, uh, for all of the things I'm showing. Oftentimes, I was inspired by something I saw from somebody online. 
And in Web Plate, there were a number of people. Uh, Sally Mann was one of them. And um, Sally Mann did Web Plate, and she embraced something that a lot of Web Platers embrace, and that is when you first start, um, you're kind of sloppy. Not intentionally, maybe, but you really just don't have it dialed in. And so you get a lot of art, what we call artifacts on your plates. There's oysters along the edges and developer marks and all kinds of things that creep into your image from the process itself. And a lot of photographers love that about the weight plate process, and they embark on that path in order to get those things on their images. But for me, that's kind of, you know, luck, right? You're just hoping something cool will happen. And again, it's not the intent that is key to me making pictures. So my intent was always to make clean plates. And um, I was not always successful, but uh, all of these images on this page are from uh, Wet Plate Collodion. And with the exception of one on the lower left, maybe, most of them are pretty darn clean and pretty free from uh, artifacts and things like that. And one of the things you can do with wet plate, by the way, is you can make both negatives and positives. So negatives you make on glass. And once you have a negative, they're great for alternative process printing that I showed before. Uh, so you can lay those right on your emulsion, do a contact print under the sun using your wet plate negative. It's fabulous for doing that. I've done that so many times. And, uh, but you can also make positives, and positives are usually made on a sheet of tin or more commonly today, a sheet of trophy aluminum that's blackened. And you make a direct positive image right out of the camera. And that's really cool. And uh, I think that probably a couple of these images I'm showing here are direct positives but the rest are negatives. And what I like about the uh, negatives is um, I, I can shoot four by five glass negatives and put them in my four by five and larger and make silver gelatin prints. And, you know, it's very versatile. So um, the uh, kind of the deer skull there was a silver gelatin print from a four by five wet plate glass negative. And, um, and this is a little technical, but you know it's it's my it's my soapbox, so I get to talk. Um, the thing about wet plate is that uh, the ISO is very low. It's at its best, it's like ISO one, and uh, so you're taking fairly long exposures, usually very wide open lenses, and there's there's kind of a relationship between ISO and grain, and I'm sure a lot of the people in this forum know that and not telling them anything they don't know. Uh, so, you know, an 800 ISO film or a 3200 ISO film, it's going to have a lot of grain no matter what you do. Um, an ISO 1 emulsion, like we're talking about with wet plate, has virtually no grain whatsoever. When you use a grain focuser on the enlarger, you can't find the grain. You have, you have to find an edge somewhere uh, to focus on because there's just no grain in the thing. Uh, so these lend themselves really well to making very large prints if you want uh, from a wet plate glass negative. So again, the unique look of wet plate inspired my creativity, inspired me to go down this path. And um, again, it's about as hands-on as you possibly can get uh, in, in, my, in my mind, uh, which made me very happy. And... Um, but it's, it's quite a laborious process, uh, even in the best cases. So it, it really takes that time and that intention on making an image and to, to uh, make what you want. And you, sh you should put the time in so that you make something that's compelling and, and a good image. So I talked about the tintype positives, and they're great. And, you know, I've made a ton of them in 4 by 5 I made a ton of them in 8 by 10 but quickly, a lot of the wet platers realize that if you're going to do a show, the bigger ones show better, okay, because they're bigger on the wall, right? Nice big print. 
but you got to do this in camera. So how do you do that? Well, um, that introduces the next area. And if you flip the slide, uh, that introduces the area of ultra large format. So wet plate is really the thing that pushed me into ultra large format. And generally, you know, you can argue the 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 size, but generally 11 by 14 and up. From, from a camera format perspective, is considered ultra large format. So um, I uh, and they don't make a lot of cameras um, anymore that are ultra large format. There's a few custom builders out there that you can pay lots of money, and so you're kind of left to see if you can find one on the you know eBay or something somewhere. Uh, pretty pretty dicey uh, odds of finding something. I chose to make a camera like a lot of ULF uh, folks do, and I made a 20 by 20 inch view camera, round my own ground glass and everything. And uh, the two folks shown in this picture are proudly holding their um, 16 by 20 uh, tintypes. So I have inserts in that camera for getting the format down to anything I want, um, like 11 by 14, 16 by 20, you know, anything I want. And as you can see, the bigger tin types are are easily displayed, very compelling. Um, again, these images aren't necessarily the best of Doug. I just uh, I wanted to get the folks who now own these tin types uh, displaying their tin types probably. But this is kind of the ultimate in difficulty because not only are you dealing with ultra large format, setting up a camera that weighs thirty pounds and really heavy duty tripods, but you're also pouring emulsion on huge plates, 16 by 20 inch plates, and, and you're trying to make clean plates without all the artifacts and chemical um, anomalies that happen. So it's, it's an extremely challenging process. And I wouldn't say that it's my favorite thing to do, but certainly it's out there and it's, it's something that I've, uh, I've worked with and kind of scratch that issue, itch, if you will. So ultra large format was kind of the natural extension of some of my tin type work and the desire to display larger, um, larger tin types in shows. So there was a question here uh, from uh, Basil. Uh, have you used film positives and enlargers to print wet plates? So I think I covered that. Um, I have used wet plate negatives in my enlarger and made silver gelatin prints from those wet plates. So uh, four by five uh, wet plate negatives, put them in the enlarger and uh, print from there. I've also used large format or ULF glass negatives with some of the alternative processes to do contact printing. So contact printing for cyanotypes or gum bichromate or any number of other processes. So, uh, yes. Oh, Phil, the question was, have you used film positives? Film positives. Um, I, I have not had great luck. With, I have not committed myself to film positives. And I'm sure, you know, it's something that I just haven't really dialed in. My, my couple attempts at film positives haven't been super successful. I have done um, paper positives, so reversal process with paper, and had some pretty mixed results with that. Um, but yeah. Okay, so that was the question. I'm not sure if I answered, but if, you, uh, if I didn't, you can clarify after we get uh, done here in the comments. So we're going to go to the next, uh, the final charts, the wrap-up, so beep. And so to wrap this up, again, my path is one of a confluence of art and science. Um, art's in my blood, and so is science. And again, the making pictures for me is action with intent, often motivated or inspired by processes and uh, some of the uh, methods that I've talked about here. And... Uh, I post a few things on my Instagram at Doug Hanson Art if you want to go check that out. But with that, I think, um, Chuck, I think we're just going to open it up to any general yeah, questions fantastic. from the group. 
Yeah, fantastic. Actually, uh, almost all of our audience tonight is uh, enabled to, to speak. So at the at the kind of the center of your screen, you'll see a little microphone. It's probably got a hash through it. You just click on that. We welcome you to ask a question live or like uh, Basil, you can also put something in the in the Q&A uh, there and we'll answer it that way. You know, Doug, I wonder if, if Basil was asking whether you took like a a positive and put it into an enlarger and then projected it onto a wet plate and then processed it as you would, as if it came out of a camera, for instance. Ah, I see. I, I think that's what he was referring to. And we do have a Q&A here. Um, yes, that's it. That was his question. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, yes, I have them. The answer is yes, I have. <clears throat> and um, it's, uh, I mean, it works. The enlarger, uh, so so wet plate is not panchromatic. Wet plate is very uh, sensitive to the blue and UV parts of the light spectrum and, uh, and is literally blind to red and orange and yellow and um, quite a bit of the green part of the thing as well. So when you use an enlarger to create a wet plate, um, it takes some fiddling and you know the 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 range of tonality uh is something that requires kind of some playing around with to get the tonality you want it's not it's not what you would expect right off at least it wasn't for me so i think we may have another <laughs> question from john balls you want to go ahead and read it doug yeah so the question from john is uh what did you use for the lens on your ultra large view camera you built so um, I, I was lucky to get into wet plate kind of uh, beginning mid craziness in, in all this. And so you could buy old brass lenses and things for not a ton of money. That is not true anymore. Um, brass lenses will cost you an arm and a leg uh, these days because the, the market has just gone crazy. But um, I'm not super picky about the lenses. So for my ULF camera, I have uh, probably three or four lenses that I favor. I have a, um, um, whew, now the names are gonna fall right out of my head now that I'm trying to think about it. I have an Olor, Olar, which is kind of, a, uh, kind of a Tessar clone, and it's a 500 millimeter F5. So the thing with wet plate is you still want a fast lens. And so the lenses get huge. <laughs> they're, they're massive. Um, I, I have one behind me on a shelf here, and, and uh, I could get pull that down if you wanted. But it's a, uh, it's a Tessar. It's a Zeiss Tessar that's a um, F45 uh, 450, I believe. And it is so massive and heavy. So... Um, the Olar is one of my favorite ones, uh, but again, for 16 by 20, it's actually a little short, right? So 16 by 20, a normal lens is 600. So I have a, um, a Zeiss process lens, which is a 600 millimeter F9 that I use as kind of my normal lens on my ULF camera. Um, that's very nice, and it's F9, which is, is workable. It's workable. And I also have a um, Nikkor, 760 millimeter process lens, uh, which is an F11. And so the exposures get a little longer, you know, with an F11 lens and an ISO one with wet plate. Uh, but that's another one I use. And I probably have a handful of others. The, the woman that I took, that, that I showed in the presentation was holding kind of a larger than life portrait of herself. I actually used a um, Nikkor 360 in a Copal 3 shutter um, to take that one because my ULF camera only has a skosh over a meter of velo. So if I wanted to get, you know, a big enlargement, I needed a, a shorter lens so I could really rack those velos out and, uh, you know, get that kind of enlargement I was looking for. So you can, you know, and, and a 360 millimeter will give you the coverage when you're doing something that close up because you're racking it out and the image circle all of a sudden is huge on the on the plane. So hopefully that answered the question. 
You know, it seems like our questions have uh, slowed down a little bit here, Doug. I, I, I would just want to comment that I think the reason John Baltz asked that is he's, a, he's an avid antique camera collector, so he's, he's probably wondering what expensive lens that you've got on yours. But in any case, uh, it's been really, really a pleasure uh, having you speak to us this evening. And again, that range of technique, it's, it's truly extraordinary. And congratulations, Doug. Uh, I do want to mention to those of you who are here in Northwest Arkansas, so Heather, Hugh, John, uh, Detlef, uh, Maggie, others of you, um, you know, there'll be an opportunity to have dinner one night, perhaps with Doug and his partner, Rachel. Uh, so I, I look forward to seeing all of you here now that we're COVID free, of course, and we can get out and be, uh, be normal again. So again, Doug, thank you so much on behalf of the Photographic Society. For well, thank you so much. Yeah. Have a great evening. The rest of your eating. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.